We believe in sustainable construction materials. Our mission is to create an industry shift towards more environmentally responsible resources. We are Colorado's premier manufacturing facility of unfired earthen masonry. Using local sand and clay, we produce both compressed earth blocks and adobe bricks. A custom line of equipment from Ital Mexicana in Mexico City allows us to produce 250 blocks an hour with the TerraPress machine. We know buildings can last for generations and can provide more than just shelter, but also a greater sense of well-being. Colorado Earth is committed to creating a healthier built environment and invites you to join our vision of truly sustainable communities. In early October 2020, Colorado Earth hosted a workshop to a small handful of attendees interested to learn how to build a masonry dome, or Boveda. Colorado Earth discovered James Anthony, a highly skilled Bovadero based in Mexico, who has built vaults and domes all around the globe. James, originally from Washington, D.C., traveled to Colorado to conduct the workshop, as well as help build the double, insulated, earth block walls that support the dome. This three-day workshop also covered application of lime plaster using BioLime, a product out of Waco, Texas. Each participant had an opportunity to lay compressed earth blocks in concentric circles to create the dome structure, as well as apply a single coat of BioLime directly to the earth block walls. The end product is a 200 square foot workshop space for the client that will certainly be a special place for generations to come. Uh, a little bit about me, um, 
I'm from back east, uh, from Washington, D.C., born and raised in Washington, D.C., looking for adventure in my teens. I moved to Colorado and uh, didn't, uh, didn't go the scholastic route and needed to support myself, and construction was something that I had been involved uh, in since, since I was able to do anything with my hands. Always passionate about construction, and I got a job on an earth ship in 93 in Bayfield, Colorado. Uh, was, oh man, I was all about it. I was looking for a job with Mike Reynolds, is his name, Mike Reynolds, in Taos, New Mexico, and it was so popular at that time that they wouldn't even accept me as a volunteer. All full. Uh, finally, I landed a job doing an earth ship in Bayfield, Colorado, and man, was I just enthralled. Uh, every step of the way, I know that I dreamt about it at night, talked about it during my sleep, and uh, was having the time of my life. But then something happened towards the end of the project when we got into the finishings of the walls. We plastered the interior. You know, we built the walls with the cans, cement, the tires, the whole bit, plenty of wire and stuff. And then when we came to the hand applied finishes, it was Adobe. Uh, it was Earth. Nobody really told me that that was going to happen. But when I got my hands into the mud, I said to the guys that I was working with, this is where it's at. This is, this is what we should be building with right here. And uh, that was a, it was a matter of months later, I landed my first Adobe job. And that became really uh, a lifelong love, uh, building with Earth. And around about 96, uh, a workshop popped up in Bosque, New Mexico, south of Albuquerque. And the title of the workshop was Adobe Arches, Vaults, and Domes. And I'd been, uh, I'd been doing plenty of Adobe and just loved it. I uh, was just so enthralled with the fact that we could build legitimate, long-lasting structures with the earth that we walk on every day. Uh, I mean, I, I can't say enough about it. I was in love. And when I went to this workshop, it was a no-brainer. I scrapped up the money however I could, went down to Albuquerque, and the, the vein that we were learning were Egyptian domes, round, uh, roundish domes, hemispherical domes, and arches as well. Believe it or not, I'd been building Adobe for a few years, but I'd never so much as built a simple arch. Uh, it was all bucks, lintels, uh, flat, flat-topped openings. And that was the, the first day of three-day seminar was arches. Uh, start, we started with the basics of arches and we built, a, I don't know, must have been a Roman arch or something like that. Wooden form. Walls came together to hug the thing. And then I think we took a quick lunch and we came back and we took the form out. And I know it seems simple. Now, nowadays it seems simple, but it's never completely... Uh, um, become unfascinating to me. I'm at a loss of words there. Uh, it still uh, sparks me every time. And so the arch is the basis for a dome. Uh, a barrel vault, for example, is a continued arch. A uh, dome like this is an arch spun around 60 degrees, uh, 360 degrees. Um, and in fact, this is, a, this is quite a privilege for me because it's kind of like coming back to the roots. Uh, this is an arch. This is adobe. I'm, I'm accustomed to working with fired material. This is unfired material. Uh, so this is bringing it all back to the basic principles that originally fascinated me. Uh, and then we went on to, in this workshop, we went on to the, the bovedas. The, it wasn't being worded as bovedas. The, Span the Spanish word for vault is boveda got into that and my god I was just floored you know everything that I thought was already so amazing that we could build walls out of now we can roof the house with I just thought this is this is I've got a lifetime of uh, of adventure here to take on and there was hands on there was an Egyptian uh, hemispherical dome that we were working on just the, the guy down there Joe Tibbetts uh, of the Southwest Solar Adobe School had a building that had been used for a few workshops already. And we were to add a few more courses during this week. And uh, here, we're going to add a lot of courses. We're going we're to get as far as we possibly can uh, with your all's hands. Anyhow, uh, 
we had some class time too and there was a classroom dark enough to do slideshows and I remember it was all great a lot of it was centered off of an experience in 1979 and 1980 when Hassan Fati an Egyptian architect had come with a few helpers from Cairo and they built a mosque in Abiquiu, outside of Abiquiu, New Mexico. A lot of it was, was inspired by, by that project and all, almost all the slides were from that. And then along come two slides that had nothing to do with this whatsoever. It was these, they were Mexican vaults that were built from the four corners of a square or rectangular space that came out and did and it was they were low lying they were not hemispherical they did this thing and and I I thought okay I'm this young squirt there's all these seasoned contractors here at the course I didn't really even feel comfortable raising my hand much less asking a question out loud but this was too much and I, I, I thought okay this has nothing to do with it and it's fascinating it was really like oh my god next level that wonderment that sense of Oh, like, how can you, how is that done? When you see it being done on video or live, how is that done? You know, he just put that brick up there. Now nothing is holding it up. And an afternoon goes by, two days, three days goes by, and now there's a guy standing on top of the thing, and there's nothing holding it from underneath. That sense of, of wonder and awe, like, how do you do it? Well, it comes down to, many of you already know this, but uh, two basic principles that, that uh I start with and always come back to compression. These buildings, uh, these structures must be built at all times under compression. They must be achieving and maintaining compression at all times uh, through the arched form that is always present in bovedas. Every kind of boveda that we could talk about is, that is always um, working with the arch. Um, and then the other one, which is happening at the same time, uh, is the relationship between the mortar and the brick or whatever masonry unit that we're using. Um, porosity is something that is my friend when I'm working uh, uh, in these structures. Because if the masonry unit is porous, the tendency is for it to suck the moisture right out of the mortar pretty quickly, especially if I haven't wet that brick or masonry piece. So you put it up on the wall with the wet mortar and it's drying out, it's making contact with the previously laid work and it's also on the brick that you got in your hand and you make contact, wiggle it just a little bit and the quicker the, the dry set, the better for you and, and you keep going. Until you've completed each course, you have not achieved compression within that present course. Um, but uh, as soon as each ring in this, in the case of this vault, is completed, you've achieved compression within the course and with your arch. This kind of hat is from the region of Mexico where I live. Mostly worn by old men. Yeah. Rarely worn by Someone's young chaps. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think it looks a little longish. Uh, from the region called Tierra Caliente. Oh, okay. Uh, hot, hot, hot earth. Oh, hot earth. Yeah. Tierra Caliente. Estas, estos son los sombreros tradicionales de, de la región donde yo vivo. <laughs> what part of Mexico is that? Morelia, Michoacán. Or what part of uh, Mexico is Tierra Starts Caliente? Is Guerrero in Michoacán. What, what region? Like, uh, Mexico City, three hours, okay. to, three, three hours west of Mexico City. Okay. Gotcha. Uh. Yeah. Um, a lot of times, guys, I wet my when I'm working with a with a lightweight, porous, low fired brick in Mexico. Um, I wet my bricks first. A lot of guys don't. I do. Uh, I do because the, the, por the porosity in, in traditional low-fired brick in Mexico is such that it, it pulls the moisture out too quickly. Mm -hmm. Too quickly for me to comfortably come on over here, lay the brick in, and 
make adjustments with the butt of my trowel or the blade of my trowel. After a, after a this or a that, the moisture has gone into the bricks and the bond is broken. Uh -huh. So what I'll do to temper that, take the pressure off me a little bit, is I'll pre-wet the brick. Just a quick dunk. Okay. But here, we're not working with that material. We're working with something far heavier and denser than I'm used to working with. But no hay problema. We can do this. So there's no si se puede. You don't get it wet at all? Uh, I didn't yesterday, but I only did five, you know, yeah. so we're, we're in this together, as I'm saying. Okay, uh, so we got some mud. I think that we don't need this in here. Company and support up here. We could have a guy that's sort of tending. We'll get, we'll get into a rhythm that's tending to the mortar so that the brick mason can focus on what he's doing. On that exterior that you're using, it doesn't absorb that much water. It's kind of water resistant. This stuff? The board, yeah. That's great. Okay, we got that going for us then. I want a little bit more in there. So you're observing the consistency. Mm -hmm. A lot of beginners get you know, kind of hone in on their, and real worried about what's going on here and they forget about what's going on here. And then if that beginner is working with me, they're always relying on me to come along because <laughs> I, I know what they're dealing with over here. I know that if there's dry uh, meatballs, I call them, in the mix, then they're creating points where they have to really battle with the work, uh, high, creating high points too, you know. That, that are sort of like, you know, a pebble in a pond. It creates ripples that go and go and go, and in the end, it turns into waves. So I always like to tell people uh, that there's, there's really no perfect bobeda out there. It's a series of adjustments from the beginning to the end. This is true in the most perfect looking finished products. Light of the perfectionist. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, these aren't, I'm not going to stick with these because of the separation, it's greater than what I want. I'm going to lay this in there and look for about a quarter inch separation. Now, Come on over to this side where Randy is. I said, you know, the, the, the foam that we set in the bond beam was, was pretty much right on. Pretty much right on. It's not absolutely right on. Um, so see what I'm doing? Mm -hmm. Angling that brick up. Because I want right. to start out in agreement with what this thing is asking us to do as much as possible. But I also want to start out with as thin of a mortar as possible which is what makes this easier, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so we're gonna see how this goes. Bring this along. You can see I need to come down on that side. The angle is satisfactory. My prediction is that this, what I'm doing right now of holding it into place, vibing with it, asking it to stay still, hoping that it does, is going to be more a part of the first course because we're adhering to dense not porous surface right now. On top of this, I'm expecting quicker results. I see. I want that to come down a little bit. I'm sure I've still got the elasticity. We're good. Hey James, do you dip any of these? I'm Why not you? dipping them yet. Okay. And you know what, but like I was just saying, this is one thing, going to the bond beam. Another thing is going to be 
from the second course on going earth block to earth block. We'll see we'll see how that changes it. I'm hoping to not have to Um, so I work with a thin joint, okay, uh, definitely I need it. Uh, I, I also like it aesthetically. Well up, up there, as you see with the first bricks that we put up there, it's going to be real thin, real thin. Uh, I work, okay, the relationship of the mortar to the brick again, I have to say, for me, success of a good quality, uh, well-built structure begins at the mortar table. Um, we're talking about the right consistency, which depends on the brick that you lay in, depends on a lot of things. Depends on the camber of what you're doing. Are you going more or less straight up, or are you coming in shallow right away, as, as in uh, this example? No meatballs in the, in the soup. Um, you want to be able to put that brick up and, and very easily displace the, ex, the excess mortar, which in the act of displacing the mortar, you're filling in all the voids. Um, but a lot of times I go for almost kind of a bone to bone, like I want to feel it touching the, rubbing the, the previously laid brick. Um, and there's always more, uh, there's always a place because these are round structures and all that. There's always a place where, or they're irregular bricks a lot of times, not here so much, but well here there, we've got a variance in there too, but they're all flat. Yeah. And down in Mexico, I work with some really funky stuff <laughs> and, and I love it. A lot of guys complain about it, but I love it, you know, the, uh, pick up the brick and sometimes I just take a quick glance at it, but more than that, I'm feeling it. Is this the right brick for that place or is this not the right brick for that place? Uh, you know, fat ones, skinny ones, kind of um, not too well shaped pieces and they come together to make a handmade, very charming, um, aesthetically pleasing product, almost inevitably. Was that one single? Uh, no. Oh, okay. Got it. Out of my trowel. We can run this over there and we can pitch it up onto the... I'll just get a little bit for him. Right. Sorry, and then I'll bring it. He's got a, um, a mortar table up there. consistent but what happens when I place it is that it comes it, th it comes thinner here at the bottom yeah. and stays thicker at the top and I think inevitably just because of experience and sort of rhythm doing this my hand is placing it so that that happens right away. Gotcha. but yeah so you can think about it when you put a brick up there yeah so but as you can see I'm not I'm not sweating that part yeah. down here but the consistency is allowing me to you know, make it real, real tight down here, and then it just stays thicker up top. All the voids being filled. Well, I haven't asked for it. Um, but we can, we can move up onto the scaffolding for sure. Do you want to? Um do your little show. What's my, I don't your, do shows. Your, uh, your pull-up show? <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> All right, you guys. All right, Ted, let's check this out. So yesterday, the, the, as I was saying earlier, the, the goal for the workday was to get the entire first course laid up, just so that I could get a feel for what's going on, no surprises, but as I mentioned, we're all in this together now. <laughs> uh, I laid up f five pieces in a pure mud mixture, just a mixture of clay and sand, just to see how it was reacting, agreeing or disagreeing with the bond beam that we just did the other day and uh, left it overnight. As you can see, you know, like this piece, we could say it's being hugged from side to side as well as the adhesion to the bond beam itself. But there's not a whole lot of compression going on as far as the whole course achieved. But I... I'm 210 pounds. 
because I've been living with my mom for a month. <laughs> and these are good, good and stuck. So I think that we're going to work our way towards success here. So I'm just going to take a quick tour. Around making sure that there's no places where we're touching the bond beam. I can see you, Lisa. All right, we're good. Now, we're not necessarily going to keep these five bricks um, because they really they were set when this thing was not calibrated. Um, but I'm going to start right next to it, taking advantage of the neighbor, the, the previously done work. It makes too much sense to to start here, so I will. Some of you are going to feel more comfortable using two hands, and that's fine. No problem at all. What is important, though, is to, you know, get it up there and go for it uh, without, without fearing what happens. If it, doesn't, if it doesn't go on there good the first time, take it off, sort of put the mortar off to the side, try it until it feels better. This one. And laying that brick in dry like I'm doing is, uh, is a good thing to do. Presenting them dry without... I like it. Okay, so you get, um, you got gloves on and all that? Okay. I'm going to pull this around a little bit. So, I'm going to hand it to you, and then I'm going to put the trowel up there, okay, for you to make adjustments. So you know what you're going to do, though. You're going to set it into place. Give it a wiggle. Look at this pie wedge. Pie wedge. You're tight down here. You got more mortar up there. Um, that's that's where it should be. And just go ahead and, and bring it against this brick. Just push it. Yeah, you don't need to maintain any thickness of mortar there whatsoever. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Now remember the pie wedge up top, so don't flatten that part out. You're good. You're looking good. Try and hold it into place with one hand. And bring the um, the little swivelly deal over. Yeah. Before you trim anything out, you know, so bring this over. Okay. I'm I'm gonna want you to be lower. How about uh, maneuver it down with the butt of the trowel or however you? Yeah. Yep. Now try it again. And now bring it all the way through the brick. I'm I'm liking the idea of a little bit lower. You're good. Okay. okay. Now trim it if you would. Sort of point this mud in. Take that. Take that out. Yeah, and we'll tuck it in with the point. Yeah. So what you're doing is, you know, filling all the empty spaces when you do that. And then take this mud off of there and dump it in the back. Because uh, once you get up on the stool here, which which you can step up onto that now, you'll see there's a hole back there. That makes sense. And then come back to the mortar table to grab the material you need to. You need? Yeah, yeah, it's going good. It's all, they're all keystones. They all are. A lot of people ask me that. So you you you, you must fit a keystone in there every time, or no, they're all keystones. Oh, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So if you're doing a vault in the same way, there's no keystone. If I put a plug in there, that's not the keystone. Right. Just it's just the last piece. Yes, I'll give it a go. 
So I think I think two things were going on there. This glassy surface, and we we had about that in there that we needed to displace. And so, so because I know that we still have this glassy surface from the duct tape uh, inside the form, I'm going to hold my weight into it. I might give it a little gentle persuasion. And check it one more time. All the while, the mortar is continuing to dry out and absorb into the brick. And then I'm going to see if that works. See how it still came down? Yeah. So what I'm going to do is still keep it in, in place. The fact that it came down tells me it's still malleable. It, 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 the bond hasn't broken. Okay? So we can still work with it. So I'm going to come in the back. Tuck this mortar in there. What's that? With the point of my trowel, tuck everything in there and hold it now. Yeah. You can. I mean, that, once it starts to start to turn it white, now like let's that, see. Then you can back off. But yeah, you can start. You can lift it, it right now and pat it down if you want. Not a problem. That's a technical test. Yeah, you, you know, you, you know, one, once or twice, and then you know, I'll come back to that one later. <laughs> you're trying to avoid the mojo, or you're trying to yeah, add no, the bad, mojo? bad, bad mojo. mojo. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. But that one had too much. <laughs> okay, I like that brick. Again, this is this is on the wetter side of what we should be working with under these circumstances, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it a shot. Yeah, exactly. It's all good. I don't want it's all good. Yeah. You know, he's holding it differently than I was, and that probably makes a difference. It's also how he has it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a lot of weight, weight that I'm adding in there with this wet mortar. I'm probably going to have to hold it in place for a minute. But it shouldn't be long that I do have to do that. So easy. Sure. See it come down just a hair? Yeah. That's, that's normal. Okay. That's, that's, and, and again, we want to see um, the, next, the next brick that goes on. I'd like to lay one more. Uh, I'm going to be aware that this one is a little slippery. Yeah, it's here. still sitting on a jiggly bed of mortar. Got it. It's going to be right. I guarantee. My confidence level is high. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's good yeah, exactly.
Um, more, more of these uh, hybrid bricks over there. We're going to have to get more bricks up here in a minute. Okay, bricks coming at you. Rockway Bueno? Uh, yeah, it's looking pretty good. Uh, how about a brick for me to see who follow here? <laughs> This is a this is a hand eye coordination, very much like you know you're developing a sensitivity to the materials that you're working with. Mm -hmm. It's inevitable, but when you when you embrace that, it comes to you quicker. Oh, okay. Uh, so. <laughs> Como se dice mortero? Mortero. Mortero. Uh -huh. oh. <laughs> oh. It's like laid back, right? Oh, and it's good. Yeah, no more adjustments. Right? Well, you're constantly paying attention to what needs to be done. And if it doesn't need to be done, it doesn't need to be done. Hey, James. Uh huh. Double batch? I'm sorry? You want another double batch of mud? Yeah, definitely. Three. Juanito. Si. You on it? Yeah, see. I've got a little less mortar going on. That kind of adjustment, that kind of micro adjustment, yeah. when, when it all adds up, that's the story that you're that you're creating, you know? Um, and I, I mentioned earlier, I think, to this group, that a bobeda is a constant series of adjustments. Right. Um, I don't want to say correction of mistakes, although it can it can fall into that realm, but you know they should be minor. Uh, but when it's a constant series of adjustments, I mean you can't you can't see it anymore after it's all done, and that's of course what you're going for. I like it. Just gonna give it a little. And look, you know, we completed a ring there. Not yet. We gotta cut a little piece in there. If it were any smaller than that, I would cut a little off of this one and throw another size chunk. But that's that's doable. We may have to. Uh, well, we got to get that piece. Yeah, piece that small. Yep. Fun break already. But guess what? I'm cool if you all are cool. I didn't see you. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to lay that in there. Yeah. Ideally, it would be a, a whole piece, but you know, <laughs> it's doing the job either yeah. way. Yeah. It's okay. Michelangelo Bordorotti. <laughs> so, see how I kind of filled that whole thing up? Now I know that. It, I place this in there and I'm going to fill all the void. And 
Yeah, what I do is I'm, I'm a lime guy and I'm very passionate about what I do in the world of lime mineralogy because I think what it does for buildings and preserving them uh, is something that I've dedicated my life to, this phenomenal mineral. But I got to say, first of all, you know, I feel like I'm at my first ACD concert when I'm a kid in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I'm blown away by this guy's work. I mean, just rock stop off the shelf. I don't know anybody in this country doing this kind of stuff now. In, the, in, the, in Italy, I was just telling James this, yeah, there's elder men that have passed this knowledge through generations and generations. And, and like he said, I have a very similar story in my focus on mortars chemistry. Uh, and uh, my, my prime concern is preserving buildings like this. You know, when you build dome architecture, vaulted architecture, there's a purpose for it over there, not just for the longevity aspects, for how it behaves in, in uh, with certain uh, climate conditions, extreme weather cycles from freeze-thaw conditions, freezing conditions, hot temperatures, and that able, is able to mitigate. The biggest problem I see with a lot of buildings, back to James's point in the beginning, was is, uh, you put these types of minerals and materials, synthetic coatings and cements and things like that, take away from the, they, they tastefully complete it, but my, my biggest focus is, is to have a, a, a breathable skin so you can allow the brick or whatever it is, if it's limestone or whether it's granite or wherever part of the world you're building, in this case, compressed earth blocks. So the long and short, but without me being blown away by James here and really wanting to just kind of go over there and let's get to it, um, my focus of BioLime, these plasters that we're going to be working with today are, um, I have developed these materials coming from my own background and, and working with historical buildings in Italy. And again, the, the, the breathable aspect of having a mortar that allows it to fuse into the substrate it's applied to is my biggest concern. And, and a building really is an anatomical representation of the people that inhabit it, right? So, you know, you have your bones and the skin is very important. That skin should breathe, it should permeate. And it's a big challenge in the world of coatings. Uh, there's a lot of ways to say, hey, it breathes, it allows this. Um, the advent of cement stucco was to, you know, make something super strong and have it protect the building so it doesn't uh, nothing can penetrate it or break it or freeze or crumble but we're starting to see the failure of that over the course of many years where it's so strong that it doesn't have that pliability to be able to adjust and settle with a building and I mean every building in the world these buildings the Roman Colosseum Pantheon they're always going through thermal expansion and contraction throughout the cycles and if you if you have not a material that will allow for that like cement, you guys have probably seen it, it shears, it cracks, it breaks, and it doesn't have that ability to, to, um, to settle with the building and become part of it. And that kind of developed into the world of, you know, elastomeric coatings, synthetics, and getting into glue-based paints to, to mitigate all that from happening. And then when the long and short of getting too deep into it, because we can take this in for hours, again, Buildings breathe with us is, is kind of my mantra with BioLime and it's taking buildings like this and allow that building to be protected, but allow it to breathe. The vapor transmission is critical. The average family of four, there's a study on it that um, from cooking, cleaning, bathing produces up to 200, 250 pounds of water per week. And this concept and idea, the vapor transmission is critical. The average family of four, there's a study on it that um, from cooking, cleaning, bathing produces up to 200, 250 pounds of water per week. And this concept and idea of having a building that is, you know, uh, watertight, 
as we all know, you know, there's all these EFIS systems and all kinds of systems in all these modern buildings that, you know, they make it so perfectly airtight that, you know, it's almost like a car door in a brand new vehicle. It's like a sponge effect where it goes, you know, and that's all great. But the problem is, is that when you have moisture from the inside, you're, you're not allowing that moisture to come out in. But now, how are you dealing with the moisture from in going out, right? And you're also dependent on the applicators of these very advanced coating systems that you're hoping that they do a good job because you get your inspectors, if there's a little pinhole on a window seal or something like that, water gets into that, drips behind the walls, and if that coating, if that system isn't allowed to wick and breathe, you get into you know moisture and traffic. Uh, I think it's phenomenal. I've come to realize though there's there's weathering aspects of it, you know, and I and the way I look at lime, lime is like a it's like a seashell. It really is, you know. It's a, a little crustacean like a hermit crab is able to grow in that little shell and it expands with the growth of it. It's not solid. It's not consistent. It doesn't stay in a form like that. Uh, but it's super super hard and durable and it gets harder as that creature starts to live and, and it gets to work like a conch shell it becomes so hard it's super durable i have put the, the coating philosophy behind biolime is based around this so it, it can actually endure and the psi gets harder and harder and harder over time so instead of degrading kind of like what i've seen throughout mud plasters throughout many years a lot of these adobe buildings that i've found myself working on recently is is has been to allow these buildings to preserve over time but not allowing the coating to degrade so it starts to become very hard and it still allows that adobe building to exfoliate moisture so it literally can sustain through time you know so but we're going to uh, be applying some of your product this weekend we are cool. yeah we have a bunch of it here so let's go you know i'm exactly <laughs> let's go right yep. so <laughs> let's save the questions for being on Somebody wants to give me a hand, and you can clean that out and put the rest of it on there, and I'll give you a tool for doing that. Okay. There's one. Mind your hands if you're going to get it on here. You can wear some gloves. And to get started, you can kind of see me. I'm going to jump on the scaffold. And y'all can pass me this, and I'll grab my go-to trowel. Leave the rest of the all round windows. Yes. Well, no, I thought it was not like another bottle. Two juice bottles. Two what? Two Santa Cruz juice bottles. Okay. 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 I imagine we're going to go right over this that might work. bond beam. Yeah. So, and that's fine for the one coat. The killer of this material, you've got your cement stuccos and things like that that depend on lath. You know, certain other types of polymer modified cements, they can stick to the block. The killer with this material is loose particulate. So, if you've got any loose dust like that, you make your best effort to get it off. Gotcha. You know, any stuff that's caught up in the joints here. And I just kind of do a, you're never going to completely get rid of it because the more you rub in, there's going to be more dust. However, once you get the bulk of it off in your working area, then you just come in with your water mister because that'll tie it up, right? You just come in and, and this is important, this is very important. So moist in your substrate. You don't want to have it saturated and dripping, but just enough. And James is saying this order, you know, just to get that suction, get that block to absorb, pull that moisture in a little bit. And at the same time, it's going to, you know, tie up a lot of that loose material out here, loose, uh, loose sands. Uh, I'm not sure. 
Hey Lisa, do we have a, a small Okay. So what you want is, is that when you get to a point where you want the material it's a little bit wet and you want it to, you know, when it starts to hang off the trowel like that where it can not fully gop and run off like a like a, a molasses or you know a curd or something. You want it to be able to be a, a little runny, but if it sticks like that, it's okay. If it's dropping, get a little more powder in there. You know. Let's see. It's getting close. So you know. Yeah. Add a little bit more powder. It should hang on tight like that. When you got it like that, it's almost ready for going. You know. If I put a little more powder. And you should be good to go. Nice job, Elizabeth. <laughs> You guys need more material? Uh, yeah, I think. All right, so we're just down to the final stages after the, applying the one coat yesterday. And we're just diluting the final finished coat. This is the extra fine product. That is a 0.3 millimeter aggregate. That's Frank with sand, about a 120 to 200 mesh fine material. And it's one of our finest in these types of powder limes. And we're just color mixing time. We're getting the final color in. This is the color called Yellow Earth that uh, Dan chose for the project. And we're just dispersing it right in the mix. And you typically get gonna put, these are already measured. We could get two of these in one full bag to give it that final pretty yellow earth color and we'll be applying to momentarily.
side. Uh, and then do a full butter on the yeah, exactly. Uh, then do a full butter on the brick. Um, so you use chunks in your mortar, or you grab chunks, bust a brick up, and you use them as your props. Now, now you're just bunch of chunks, putting stuff together. Yeah. 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 Tell me. What I want is a piece to go in there, but maybe we will. No. Lisa, let's look at the further. There's only his behind it. Jeff, see that chunk over there by the cinder block? Uh, by the speed square? Uh, okay. That one. So yep. Let's do a partial. All right. A small one like this. Yeah. That way we can get it over here. Yep. So if this one would be the next one. And then another piece to go in there. Yeah. Like that. And then it begins to kick up. That's what I'm, that's what I'm, that's what I'm. You just kind of have to have faith. Um, looking for a piece to go in there. And the uh, hatchet is proving to be a lot of work up here. So you're going to hold your brick up with this and see if you line up? Let me see if I'm just going to do that, okay? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the hatchet's a lot of work with these uh, bigger, like more concrete blocks. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a lot better. Yeah. Yep. We just have a skinny one. Let's see, play that one first. Yep. Yeah. This is kind of what was sitting in my head as an idea for the fan here by himself, right? Because it'll just start getting vertical. Couple more uh, full lines. Even, even if the face doesn't get totally vertical, it'll still just kind of sit there and lean on itself, right? You don't need to get it straight up and down at the end. You can go to right and just leave it. Yeah, yeah, I think that would have to be that way, actually. Okay, so then at this point, I would look for a cut here and a cut here and one brick in the middle, let's say, for example. But remember, we're in the, we've got a 90 degree corner. We don't have a round corner. I'm sort of rounding this up, around about, but you can see. Of course, yes. Yeah. So by this time, these are you having to little follow little in a straight, sure these right here are, are parallel to each other and following a straight line. And this is the curvature zone. And as it grows bigger and bigger, and these are, out, these are further away from the curve, then it allows you to elongate the curve smoother and smoother every time. Because this is the this is the awkward fumbling start. For me, it's never like, oh man, that was just so graceful. My first five pieces. It's always like, like, <laughs> yeah. And I, and it's for me, it's always important to get it right from the very very beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't like to.